So once again, thank you for joining us today for our presentation or workshop on storytelling with digital tools. Uh, we are going to jump in because we have quite a bit of content to cover within an hour, and it's really important to us that we get time to talk and share at the end because I think that's where a good portion of our learning comes from. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Stacey Allen. I worked... Ooh, I just realized my video wasn't on. I really apologize. Um, I've worked for Learn for about three years, um, also as part of the Receive for the Anglophone community that helps with uh, technology integration. And I began getting interested with Education for Truth and Reconciliation while I was teaching in uh, Nunavik for about seven years. It's really when I started becoming passionate and learning about storytelling and digital tools. So I'm really excited to be here with you. Um, Lexi, I'll hand it over to you if you want to introduce yourself. Yeah, so my name is Lexi Tucker. I'm formerly an elementary school art and drama and other things teacher. I've been with LEARN since last year, working in the same capacity as Stacy. So both with LEARN and as the um, receipt for the Anglophone community. And shortly, um, one of our colleagues, Liana, will be joining us. I think she's just stuck in a bit of traffic at the moment, um, but you might see her pop in shortly as well. So as we begin, I just want to kind of quickly go over an overview of what we're going to talk about and explore today. Uh, the first part to being right now, welcoming an overview. Uh, then we're going to jump in and actually, I think it changed it. Then we're going to have a story time because we can't talk about storytelling without having a story. Uh, then we're going to quickly introduce you to some digital tools that you might be able to infuse in your classroom. And then finally, we're going to shut off the camera recording and we're going to have a discussion and share about what you're already doing in your classroom and how we can work together to uh, promote and infuse the uh, Indigenous cultures and ways of knowing and being in your classroom. So um, to begin, it's always really important to me that I acknowledge where I'm from. Uh, the LEARN office is located on uh, in Laval on the traditional territory and meeting grounds of the Ganigahaga and lots of other nations. I personally am located in the Eastern Townships on Abenaki territory. It's, uh, it's extremely important to me to acknowledge where I'm from uh, as an uninvited guest or non-Indigenous person living here. Um, I think about my family and all the benefits that the land and the animals and the nature give to us that we're able to feed ourselves that we can go play in the snow and build snow forts. Um, so all of that gives me kind of a sense of responsibility to do this kind of work and help support indigenous students and communities as in the best way that I can. Um, so if you're new to this kind of work you're just starting to learn uh, whose land is a fantastic resource for you to learn more about uh, where you're from. They've got like great music videos, information from different bands' websites uh, that you can check out. We actually had the opportunity to do a webinar with uh, the Who's Land team back in September uh, with Christine Mallott, who's a great Anishinaabe educator based out of Winnipeg. Uh, so there is a link to the recording there if you wanna check it out. And I also invite you to welcome, introduce yourself in the chat, your role, where you're from, so we can get to network and get to know each other better, because um, that's through those relationships that our collective knowledge can be built. Um, I apologize if I'm going too fast, because I'm very quite passionate about stories. <laughs> um, and it feels like a bit of a monologue, but um, stories are great. They're cross-curricular. You can use stories in your language classes, French, uh, English, Inuktitut, you know, any language that you're teaching, especially if you're teaching uh, language learners or looking at language revitalization, because you can do a lot of stories in a bilingual or trilingual kind of context. Um, they're also good for as educators, you know, in math, you can use stories and social sciences and any in, in gym. Um, so they're really something that I encourage you to bring into your classroom, but I'm probably most of you are already. Um, some of the powerful things about stories, especially if students are creating their own stories, is that they can infuse their own voice. 
I believe, in their practice. So they get to uh, share their own experiences and through that, you know, build confidence in their own voice and sharing it and feel proud and all those wonderful things that come along with expressing who you are and your identity. Um, they also illustrate the student's understanding in different ways and maybe traditionally like having the students write a text to show their understanding. They can, especially with digital tools, animate it, add their own voice, recordings, images, so you get a better understanding of their perspectives uh, in their classroom. And again, like I said, student-generated content, whenever you can give students choice, uh, we've really found in my personal experience that it's more engaging and meaningful learning for the students. Um, a note about when you're using stories, especially uh, Indigenous creation stories or other stories that by Indigenous peoples, that it's always best we find to go with your local nation stories if possible. Um, so really we encourage you to reach out to people in your communities, knowledge keepers, elders, uh, whatever kind of contacts you can build in relationships to try to bring those local stories into your classroom. Um, I know it's not always easy, especially like some stories also like are like share or not maybe shared with non-Indigenous people too, or that communities don't always, like in my experience, maybe not shared. So really seek guidance if you can. And uh, if you can't maybe get your own local nation, try to ch maybe like challenge yourself to like find at least a nation in Quebec or then a nation in Canada and kind of branch out that way. Um, one question we get a lot about is like culturally appropriate and obviously like I'm not Indigenous so I can't really speak to that fully, um, but what I can say is that most of the time when I've done this kind of work and I come to uh, an Indigenous elder, knowledge keeper, educator, and I'm humble about like, hey, I, I really want to bring this, I want to support my Indigenous students in my classroom, it's super important, and you ask about whether it's culturally appropriate, Usually people are really appreciative of that and willing to support you. Um, and uh, I've also found like ways that usually kind of seem to go well are like extending stories. So for example, one of my favorite stories is an Inuit story about a little dog named Kemik who for elementary that he's uh, learning how to pull a sleigh along with his, uh, his owner. Yes. And um, like that story, I often remix with my students saying like, okay, now we read the story, what comes next? What can you picture the next steps in the story? Or what came before the story? And that was the kind of ways that students kind of grasp on to that are kind of fun, I've noticed. Um, and finally, because I'm talking a lot, um, digital tools enhance your story in UDL. Like I said before, instead of just like maybe necessarily writing it on paper or adding visuals, you can like dive into the world of digital tools and far of like finding animation, coding your own things, adding recordings and videos and really adds another dimension for students to express uh, themselves. So, of course, if we're doing storytelling, it's great to follow a process, regardless of what approach, if you're remixing a story or creating your own stories. Um, so we did in our Padlet that we didn't quite sure yet, but it's going to be maybe on the next slide, uh, include some graphic organizers that we find helpful when uh, you're planning out with your students what might be included and what not, um, kind of that brainstorming piece. Um, then it's good to always use the tools finally to dive into the stories. We always recommend thinking about it, like I said before, with a graphic organizer so that the tool doesn't like take away from the actual pedagogy and what you're trying to get at with your students. And uh, finally, I think most important step is for students to have the opportunity to share their stories with others, people from their community, maybe some you invite elders or people coming in to share the learning and also for students to reflect, to move further as an assessment for learning. Um, and then again, we have our resource padlets and we tried to do not every resource is obviously bilingual, but to give you examples of English and French for, uh, so that it could apply um, for what some of you might be teaching right now. Okay, um, so 
we can't talk about stories, like I said, without storytelling. So I just found this short little video of a book. It's a read aloud. It's about two minutes um, for you guys to watch. And it's by Julie Flett, who's Creamy Tea, and she's based out of BC. So I'm just going to zoom over and I apologize because it's on YouTube. If the screen or if an ad pops up, I've tried to shut all that off. Um, so, yeah. Hello, friends. Welcome to Mrs. Kapoor's Story Time. Today, we are going to read a book called We All Play. It's written by Julie Flett. Kime Tawanal. So let's begin. Animals hide and hop and sniff and sneak and peek and peep. We play too. Kime Tawanav, Nina. Animals swim and squirt and bubble and bend and chase and chirp. We play to Kimitavana, Mina. Animals slip and slide and rumble and roll and wiggle and wobble. We play to Kimitavana, Mina. Animals rustle and roast and nudge and nuzzle and yip and yawn and slowly side by side animals fall asleep we do too Nistan and Nina that's a cute so that's just a really short like kindergarten cycle one example of a book by an Indigenous author from Canada that I personally could envision like bringing into my classroom and then saying, okay, now what kind of animals do you like? What are your favorite animals? And what kind of like links can you make between the things that the animals are doing and you're doing? So it could kind of be like a science kind of you know, expression, narrative, um, using digital technology that might be um, suitable for your classrooms. So I hope you liked my story. I thought it was kind of cute. Um, okay, so I'll go back to slideshow mood. Um, so finally, we're going to get into the tools, the exciting part. Um, we kind of picked four free tools to explore today. Um, depending on what level you teach, because we had people from kindergarten to like post-secondary sign up. Um, the first one being Scratch Junior, which I really like. It's good for preschool, uh, cycle one. That being said, I've also used uh, Scratch Junior up until like cycle three, because it's a really great um, tool to introduce scratch and coding with blocks um, without maybe students getting bogged down with some of the bigger blocks and um, like text in the program. Um, then we have Scratch for cycle two up to adult. It's really fun. You can make games, stories, and things with it. Um, Twine, which is a great like nonlinear um, storytelling tool, which Lexi is going to share with us a bit later. And finally, Stop and Emotion, which is preschool to secondary, which is a fun one. Um, so first, I'll talk about Scratch Junior. Um, it's available on tablet. It's not um, usually like as Chromebook um, kind of thing. Um, it's free. It's available in a ton of different languages, just like Scratch. Um, like I said, one of the great things is that it's really easy to use and you can also customize your character. It comes with a lot of preloaded characters and backgrounds that you can use with students. They can even take pictures of like their own face and input them into uh, characters, which is kind of fun. So I'm gonna show you quick example, something, oops, it took me like two or three minutes to make. Um, so there, that's a picture of the coding that I took, again, really quickly. So burr, it's cold in Kujuak, as you see my face. I have to go to the store. Ah, ice, ouch. So <laughs> you can see, super easy um, story actually happened, got kind of hurt, you know, but um, that students could bring in, it's really fun uh, way to animate their uh, education. Okay, now we have Scratch, very similar. 
like the grown up version of Scratch Junior. It is available as an app, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Lexi, and also web based. You can use it without um, uh, account or logging in, but there's also some kind of advantages that we could get into later to creating your own student and teacher accounts. Um, in the pilot, we do have some resources in HyperDoc showing how that can be done, and we can talk about that later. Um, again, I'll just show you very, very, very quick, simple kind of example of what that might look like for students. You can kind of see the example difference between Scratch and Scratch Junior. Um, so an example, this is one I found online because the great thing with Scratch is you can always remix something. So if you find a project that you like, students can actually open it up in their book bag, make changes to the sprites, to what is said, the context, and quickly create something really great. Um, so here we have two people. Oh no, there's a blizzard. I'll go pull the sled. About an hour later, we're here. The end. Little story. Personally, the only thing I'm wondering is why those people are in t-shirts in a blizzard. Doesn't really make sense to me, but yeah, great uh, example. Um, so uh, I don't know if there are any questions so far. I guess maybe we'll make time for that to the end because we're almost done. Um, Lexi, did you want to go ahead and talk a little bit about Twine? Yes, I can. So Twine, as Stacy mentioned, is a great tool for creating non-linear stories. So um, if you maybe are familiar with choose your own adventure stories or those, there's now even on Netflix kind of interactive um, shows and movies where you can, you know, select from a number of options how you want the story to proceed. So you can see that on the left hand side, there's the light blue image, you can see the basically in twine, you can create a passage. And from that passage, you can go in a linear way, but then you can also start creating branches where um, the reader would then have to select from a number of choices. And it can be two, or it could be five, or it could be, you know, any number of choices. Um, in the slideshow there, you have an example which is uh, Space Frog. It's not a, um, you know, it's just a generic story, but I have gone through all of the passages and there is, um, it's a very appropriate, uh, you know, there's nothing inappropriate in it because just as a, a warning, if you're looking for twine stories that exist on the internet, it is a platform that has been used by, you know, anyone and everyone. So there are stories that may or may not be appropriate for students to, to um, look at. But this space frog one is a great example. It's a nice, simple example that you can show students and they can, um, you know, read and play with it and then go create their own. So it's fairly easy to get started. Um, there is a tiny bit of coding, but if you can type in a Word document or like a Google document, you can, you can make Twine work and it's free. And um, you can, there's two ways you can use it. First, you can download it to your computer and use it that way, or you can use it in any web browser. And you do not, you do not need an account. Um, basically, all of your work is saved in your uh, browser's cache. So that's just something to be aware of. You can choose to save the file to your computer and then re-upload if you'd like. So I think that's Twine. And then our last one that we wanted to share with you was Stop Motion. Um, so we recommend the iMotion HD app, but there are a number of other apps if you are already familiar with um, on your whatever device you're using. Um, some Chromebooks too, there are like Stop Motion apps for Chromebooks as a, like an extension in the Google Chrome browser. So there's a wide variety of tools that you can use to create stop motion videos. Um, and then, you know, we like to use things like Lego or clay, but it can really be anything that students can manipulate and create their stories that way. And usually it's just a matter of clicking, you know, take a photo and, you know, you move your, your characters a slight amount and take the photo again, and it's building the story that way. And then these apps usually will, place all of those photos together in a sequence and you can control things like 
um, the speed and the frames per second. And then it can be fun to add on, um, you know, asking students to add narration to it or sound effects or music. And that can be done in several different ways. Um, and so we have an example um, in that corner there. I don't know, if Stacey, if you wanted to show that example right now. Yeah, sure. And of course, this is an example that's professionally done. I'll mention that it's with the um, National Film Board, which offers uh, great services for teachers. We'll actually be doing a webinar with them later if you want to check it out. Um, so yeah, and I think I just want to mention too, I think iMovie was one of the ones that we kind of suggest go along with it if you want to add narration or images and stuff after your iMotion. Stacy, I think you need to share sound maybe. Or maybe the sound does, I don't know if the sound matters. Might not be playing it. Oh, okay. So not ideal, but I'll try. It's okay. So I don't know if you guys heard the sound. It was comes with some really great music. I was jamming out, but I really apologize that you really aren't able to hear it. Um, great. So I guess now um, we have our discussion questions. I'll read them and then we can pause uh, the recording and talk and share. Um, so kind of the first question is, how are you currently using stories to support uh, the infusion of Indigenous perspectives in your classroom? What kind of resources and strategies are you using? Can we like included a few kind of free and uh, paid resources in the Padlet that you might want to check out, um, focusing on Quebec and Indigenous uh, orgs in, in Canada? Um, then thinking about one, which one of these digital tools might be best suitable, uh, best suited for your learners and that how could it maybe enhance what you're already doing in the classroom? And finally, what is your experience with regards to using local Indigenous stories in the classroom? Has it something you've done before? Is it something that's new to you? And maybe we can share kind of our experiences and uh, talk about it. If you want to have more resources in order to bring storytelling into your classroom, I want to encourage you to check out the Digital Competency in Action website. This website was produced by the Receive for the Anglophone community here in Quebec, and it contains a treasure trove of different resources. Um, the site is bilingual, and it includes uh, different apps you can use with your students, uh, how to introduce robotics, open creative spaces, recordings, where you can kind of tinker alongside and work on those STEAM projects with your students. It also contains information about teacher competencies, including Competency 15, which was produced by Fennec. Um, another great source is the Learn website, of course, and we have worked really hard to put together a topics page on education for truth 
and reconciliation with many different padlets, including information on language revitalization tools, scholarship opportunities for Indigenous students, and different literacy and lesson plans that were produced by nations in Quebec. So I encourage you to check those out. Um, finally, I just want to say a big nekonik, miigwech, thank you, merci, and in many different languages for you taking your time to join us today or to watch this recording and learn about how we can better support Indigenous and non-Indigenous students in our classroom by the infusion of Indigenous perspectives. So thank you. Bye.